Good morning, everybody. My name is Kieran Collins, and I'm moderating our first Winter Crop Agronomy Update webinar of 2021. This event is part of the Chagas Tillage Month, where we will deliver the latest insights on current tillage research, plus the most relevant technical advice for tillage farmers through a series of live interactive webinars. We would normally be in the fields at this stage, but like everybody else, we've had to adapt to the current circumstances. So we have recorded video clips from crops to give you a sense of how crops are looking in different locations around the country. Today, we will be looking at winter barley, winter oilseed rape, and winter wheat. The first crop we will look at today is winter barley. Kieran Hickey is in Wexford, where he advises on fertilizer application. Mark Trimble is in Kildalton College, comparing the management of two row and six row hybrid varieties. And John Brophy reports from Louth, where weed control is the concern. We will have a discussion forum after each crop. So remember to submit your questions via the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. This is the winter barley variety uh, Joyu, a six row, which was sown on the 15th of October. Um, we're getting 55 plants in the hoop here, which is 0.2 of a meter squared, which is 275 plants per meter squared. The crop was sown at 183 kilos to the hectare and has a thousand grain weight of 51. So 183 kilos multiplied by 100 divided by 51. We sowed 358 seeds, 275 established, given 77% establishment rate. So that would be anything over 75 would be regarded as quite good. Assess crops to see what level of establishment. Check current soil sample, P index and K index. K index. Check to see the nutrient requirements. Choose the appropriate compound and a strategy or number of splits. Target to get 40 units of nitrogen on with P and K before growth stage 3031 or mid-March. This will be enough to help with tillering and to boost the crop. After crop assessment, if the crop is lush and heavily tillered, one might delay the application of nitrogen until mid to late tillering in March. If the crop is short on tillers or is a six row hybrid that may need an early boost, you may opt to split the first application. Firstly, at the start of tillering in February, with for example, 1.5 bags to the acre of 9, 10, 25, which gives 13 and a half units of nitrogen per acre, a small requirement at this stage as the crop is just beginning growth. To be followed by two and a half bags of 9, 10, 25 in early to mid-March before growth stage 30 or nearing the end of tillering. This will supply 22 and a half units of nitrogen per acre. This 36 to 40 units of nitrogen will supply the uptake of nitrogen required during this tillering stage. With the main application of nitrogen then being applied as we move into the high end requirement and rapid growth phase of stem extension in the crop in April, 80 to 100 units of nitrogen in this application. We're here in uh, Kildalton College and the trial plots and um, on my left here is Belfry six row hybrid and on my right we have uh, Valerie which is a two row conventional. Uh, they were both sown on the 13th of October. The Belfry at 230 seeds per square meter and the Valerie at 330. So we reckon there's a between 85 to 90 percent establishment here so it's it's done very well so far and um, we're sown in good conditions and, and rolled afterwards. Um, the next thing then on the 1st of December it got a uh, herbicide, it got two litres of tower, uh, 0.2 of DFF and a lot, an aphicide along with that. So the the annual meadowgrass challenge was fairly significant here but but it looks to have done a, a fairly good job uh, there's a bit of bit of uh, frost heave we can see with the with the annual meadowgrass but uh, there's good control um, not too much sign of broadleaf weeds but we'll be keeping the the crop assessed to see if there's any 
any cleanup uh, needed, but unlikely probably. So from a, a growth stage point of view, the, probably both at 23 to 24 growth stage, with the Belfry slightly more advanced than the, than the Valerie. So the next uh, for this crop will probably be nitrogen in early March. And I suppose the main question then is, will the management of the two varieties be the same for the rest of the season? Today we look at follow-up weed control in winter barley. This, this crop of Infinity Winter Barley was sown on the 26th of September 2020. Follow-up weed control may be needed on crops where weeds have escaped the pre- or post-emergence weed control. An example of weeds may include charlock, chickweed, groundsel, fumitory, speedwell or corn marigold. Some of these weeds may be resistant to earlier weed control or may be late germinators. Crops should be walked and target weeds identified. This will determine spray programme needed. Weeds such as chickweed may be resistant to ALS chemicals such as sulfonylureas, so a partner mix may be needed such as Cypar or Galaxy. Priority should be given to most competitive weeds and weeds in most abundance. Weeds such as groundsel are dirty weeds but are not competitive. See the competitive index chart on the Tagish crop report. This shows that the number of weeds per metre squared needed to reduce crop yield by 5%. 83 plants per metre squared of groundsel is needed to reduce yield by 5%, whereas you only need 1.7 cleaver plants per metre squared to reduce yield by 5%. This crop was treated with in situ at 0.4 litres per hectare on the 1st of 10, 2020, and the weeds present are groundsel, chickweed, fumitory, and cleavers. The plan is to treat this crop with Cameo and Galaxy. Crops should be treated when mild enough to do so and the field is, tra is trafficable and weeds are present in the crop. Beware of growth stage timings and label restrictions. And so, in summary, walk the crop and ID the weeds. Use this to decide on the weed control strategy. Make sure conditions are correct for chemical application and log on to the Tagish crop report to check the weed competitive index chart and also a list of chemicals for the weed follow-up control. Okay, thanks very much to, thanks very much to um, Kieran, Mark and John there. Um, and I suppose it's good to get insights from different crops in, in different parts of the country. So um, again, just a reminder, if you have any questions, use the Q&A tab there at the bottom of your screen and uh, the panel will, will get to them there. So speaking of the panel, uh, just to introduce our panel, we've got Richie Hackett, uh, who's a researcher at Chagas Oak Park. Um, we have Shea Phelan, also from Oak Park, is a crop specialist based there. And then we have Jimmy Staples, Jimmy is the advisor on the Enable Conservation Tillage Programme. And for a bit of geographical balance, we've got Michael McCarthy, who's a tillage advisor um, based in Cork. So you're all very welcome. And again, uh, just a reminder to, to submit your questions. Um, I think the only place to start, Mark Trimble posed a question, lads, in, um, in Kildalton. He had a uh, a six row hybrid on one side of him and he had a two row uh, conventional variety, Valerie, on, on his other side. And I suppose the question Mark had is, um, do we treat these varieties the same or should management be different throughout the season? So I suppose, Richie, I might start with you. Um, I know you've done some work in, in this area. Yeah, we, we've compared the hybrids with the conventional six rows and, and two rows. And generally what we found that there's no great difference in terms of how you would approach managing uh, them. Uh, you would basically take each variety irrespective of what, what it is, whether it's a hybrid or a six row and manage it as in, it, as its, own, in its own right. Uh, in terms of nitrogen, we've compared, you know, looking at early and late nitrogen on, um, on the two rows and hybrid six rows and conventional six rows, and we couldn't find any consistent difference in terms of when you would start your nitrogen program on them. Uh, I know some of my colleagues, uh, former student Rob Beatty and John Spink would have looked at them in terms of, uh, you know, uh, fung fungicide inputs and, and they would have generally found that there's no difference uh, between, no consistent difference between the hybrids and the, the, the non-hybrid varieties. Uh, so I suppose in su to sum it all up, it's, you take each variety 
on its own merits and, and treat it uh, accordingly. I suppose one thing about the, the hybrids is that some of them tend to be a little bit earlier developing, developing than say the, the conventional varieties. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Richie. So you, you treat each variety as you say on its on its own merits, its individual characteristics, rather than whether it's a a hybrid or or a conventional. And Richie, while while I have you there, I suppose you you did mention nitrogen, and I suppose it's it's a topic for debate every year, where people say, you know. We see the first signs of growth there coming from the middle, the end of February, and when should I go with my first nitrogen? Maybe you might just comment there on, on that one. Yeah, again, that's a question that we've done a lot of uh, trials on over the years. And certainly if you put nitrogen on, say, in, in February compared to the, the middle of March, uh, the, the crop that gets the nitrogen in February will always look better um, in, you know, in March, April and in, into May than the one that gets where you held off the nitrogen until March but when it comes to yield uh, there's very little difference so um, uh, I think the advice would be that there's, there's no mad panic to get out with nitrogen in, in February and certainly not under the current conditions soil temperatures are after dropping considerably the last few days and it's quite a wet weekend forecast so I wouldn't be in any rush out but you know towards the, the end of February early March you, you, that, that's probably uh, when you need to start thinking about uh, nitrogen on, particularly on, on barley Okay, perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Richie. And I suppose, Michael, maybe just to come to you based maybe a little bit further south, I might just ask maybe just to comment on, on your your view of how winter barley is looking, Michael. Was the establishment good? Has it wintered well, maybe? Yeah, for the most part it has, Kieran. Um, <clears throat> the earlier sowing crops are probably that bit more advanced than the later sowing crops. I know down here, you know, the later it went into October, conditions were a bit heavier and harder going so you know but for the most part crops are, are, are looking well um there's no hunger appearing yet in any crops you know um you know we've seen over the years that when you hit february you get the the first yellows start coming but i always tend to look at the the overlaps of where you know where the drill would overlap and headlands and they're the first places you'll see for that kind of nitrogen deficiency to start coming up but it's not it's not showing yet and nor is there showing manganese um, in fairness, crops crops are looking good. Uh, can I just come to Richie's point there with the the, the, the nitrogen timing? Um, I, I'd I'd have a lot of farmers down here that would be, you know, very much promoters of the early nitrogen. Um, but last year we had a wet February, so there was very little opportunity to to get out with early nitrogen, and a lot of nitrogen didn't go out on crops until March, and it made no difference at all to the yields of barley. We'd still some very, very good yields of barley last year. So that early nitrogen timing, you know, it, it, it brings out a great green in the crop in, in early March, but that's that's about as much as it ever does in, in my book. Now, unless you have a, an absolutely struggling crop that, mm. you know, you could have tiller debt or something like that. You know, we, we get it down here on the on the coastal areas where you have hard wind coming in off the sea that you could have tillers in trouble. Like that probably would be a scenario that where earlier, earlier small bit of nitrogen would do uh, would have an effect but okay. you know, remember Thanks, too like Michael. crop isn't going to take a lot of nitrogen early like so yeah very yeah. very sensible advice there um shay if i if i can turn to you we saw john brophy was looking at weed control there i think in general i suppose most people got a chance to put um get some herbicide out on, on winter barley this year uh, we've got a question here um in cold conditions what are the best broadleaf products to use maybe you, you might answer that one and maybe just maybe what maybe people might use in terms of tidy up um tidy up this spring uh, shea yeah it's a very good question Kieran, because um i know there are guys out there who are kind of maybe struggling with with some weeds that have got through the system and um, maybe some guys didn't even get to spray um prior to christmas and um, they might have a, a nice bank of weeds there in them um, as a kind of a double-edged sword, I mean, if you're trying to control weeds in cold conditions, weeds aren't actively growing, so you don't tend to get as good a control with your herbicides as you do when the weeds are actively growing. So if you're looking at, depends on the weed spectrum you have, I suppose, if you're looking at, say, the likes of annual meadowgrass, <clears throat> I mean, there's very little control that you're going to achieve at this stage with the products that are there. I mean, if you look at the, your, your typical grass weed products that you're going to use, the kind of pendy metal type products. At this stage, annual metal grass is going to be pretty strong and probably tillering at this stage. So you might, while you might get some suppression um, or even with cloud tolerant, you might get some suppression. You're probably not going to get um, full control. 
So really and truly what you're looking at now for the vast majority of weeds that are there, so the problem we'd said something like grounds or something that's come through, are your, your, your spring type herbicides. So you're looking at likes of your Cameo Max type products or, or that. Um, okay. Other products that might be, might be you know, other pro- you look at mainly your spring type products there that, you know, that, you're, that, that are going to control your, your weeds for you. The one product I suppose that probably does work a little bit better in cooler conditions like is a Zypar. Um, okay. which probably will work that little bit better in cooler conditions. But again, it's about tailoring your product to the weed that's there. Um, figure out what weeds you need to control and then decide what strategy you need to go with. Um, and if that means that you're using those spring type SU herbicides, then you may wait until you get a bit of growth and a bit of kind conditions to, to, to apply. Okay, there. Thank, thanks, Shay. And just before we leave Winter Barley, and, and we will have time at the end maybe to come back to, I, I have a few more questions here that we didn't get to, but Shay, just as you're on that topic, I suppose something that crops up every year is tank mixing in the spring. You know, you might have a tidy up on weeds, you might have growth regulator, maybe fungicide, you might just maybe a bit of advice on that one. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it always is a bit of a struggle and there's a bit of a, is, you know, it can take an extra pass, I think, now is kind of the way I'm looking at it now. If you look at where some crops are at the moment, they might need trace elements, they might need a PGR in order maybe to manipulate tillers, they might need a tidy up of herbicides, and they may also need a fungicide in March as well if, if you have a lot of net blotch or wrinkle or something like that in the in the crop. Quite often guys try to put all that into one tank. And I suppose you have to look at uh, weather conditions we generally get in March, we kind of get, you can get large fluctuations in temperatures, day and nighttime temperatures in March. And that's a stress on the crop on its own. So if we throw in a whole heap of chemistry, five, six, seven way mixes in on top of that crop that might already be stressed, you're going to stress it even more. And we've seen that in the last couple of years, whereby due to no other fault other than time pressures, guys were having to combine all these big tank mixes they do stress the crop and they can stress the crop if you get the wrong, wrong conditions at the wrong time. So okay. what you'll see, if, if any of you, and it's online at the moment, um, the cost returns booked it for this year. What we've done in that this year, Kieran, is we've actually added in another pass uh, in the cost returns booklet just to kind of mirror that, whereby that kind of March, April, early April kind of control, where you're trying to control a couple of different things in the crop we've kind of split those into two passes. So you might go with a a PGR or something like that early on where you're trying to manipulate tillers, then come back in with a fungicide or a herbicide or whatever it is. And why loads has to come into there, come in there as well. No, no, no bother. Thanks, Shay. Um, I'm just aware there are a few more questions that we didn't get to, but like I said, if we do have time at the end, we will, um, we will try and get to them there, particularly around the area of nitrogen. So we we might just come back to some of those again. So next up, we're going to look at um, at winter oilseed rape. We've got Veronica Nyhan is in Leash. We've got Elaine Clifford is in Cork. And Martin Burke is reporting from from Wicklow. So we again just a reminder: any questions, use the Q and A tab, and we'll try and get to them in the discussion forum. Hi, I'm standing here today in Strab Valley County Leash in a crop of winter oilseed rape to talk to you about the use of green area index as a management tool for guiding nitrogen management over the coming weeks. This crop, seed crop, of Dariot oilseed rape was sown on the 11th of September this year at a seeding rate of 50 seeds per metre squared into a ploughed tilled uh, seed bed. It received a bag and a half of 10-10-20 in the seed bed and was followed with salsa in October and astro curb with the frost in November. Today it stands at a plant count of 45 plants per metre squared, so it's established well and is relatively evenly distributed across the field. We now want to try maximise the yield of this crop going forward. Green area index is a measure of the green leaf and stem area per metre squared of ground, and it would indicate how much nitrogen is in the canopy at the present time. For every one unit of GAI, we have 50 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare in the canopy. Our target is to be at three and a half GAI or 175 kgs of nitrogen per hectare at flowering. So how do we know what we are now and how do we get there? Well, the app will allow you to see what the GAI is in this crop. 
So if you go to the App Store and download the app by typing in G-A-I-O-S-R, you can bring it out to the field and open it up in the field. Then holding it about a metre and a half above the crop on a relatively overcast not a cast or not too sunny day, just simply take the photo and submit it. And when you've done that, it will tell you what your GAI reading is for the crop. You should also do it at least three times around the field just to be sure that you're getting a, a representative reading for the entire field. You can also email the result to yourself and have it on record when you get home. So if this crop has a GAI of 1 and this has come in um, at just 1.11, then it allows us to know that we have 50 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare in the crop. To get to the 3.5 at flowering, we now need to put out another 210 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare or 168 units per acre. And that's to take into account nitrogen use efficiency. Ideally, we'll put this out in three splits. The first in early March at 50 kgs to the hectare or 40 units per acre. Again in mid-March at 100 units or kilograms per hectare, 80 units per acre. And finishing in late March, early April at seed set for, with uh, 60 kgs per hectare or 48 units per acre. Because of the high sulfur requirement of oilseed rape, it's ideal that you use a high sulfur um, fertilizer in the first two splits because you need between 24 and 28 units per acre of sulfur as well. I'm now going to hand you over to my colleagues in the south and southeast to look at winter oilseed rape is doing down there. I'm here in East Cork looking at a crop of winter oilseed rape. The, the variety is DK expansion and it was sown on the 8th of September at a sowing rate of 3.5 kilos to the hectare. Um, it received a herbicide application then of Stratus Ultra on the 29th of September and an application of Astrocurb on the 8th of December. Um, as well as that, it also received a fungicide application of proline on the 18th of November. So we've done a green area index calculation on the crop over the whole entire field to get a good average. Um, which came out at 1.8 GAI, ranging from 0.5 up to 2.2. Having assessed the crop for, um, for disease, we found no light leaf spot on, on the leaves of the plant. Um, so having got its first fungicide application in early November, uh, we're going to just assess the crop over the next couple of weeks and at the first detection of any disease, it'll get a fungicide application. In terms of nitrogen application then we're going to hold off on early nitrogen until the early days of March um, given that the GEI is quite good for the growth stage the crop is at. So just to compare we're looking at a different crop of DK expansion here that was sown four days later than the first crop we looked at. It's two miles up the road and the only difference is that this crop didn't receive an application of pig slurry like the previous crop. This crop got a herbicide application of Stratus Ultra and Salsa on the 10th of October because there was a lot of Charlock present and it got a second herbicide application on the 2nd of January of Astrocarb. It didn't receive any fungicide application in the autumn because there was no signs of um, light leaf spot or foma. Okay, so obviously this crop isn't as dense as the previous crop we saw, so it's a bit thinner and the, we did a GI calculation on it and it worked out at 0.75. Um, so it's a bit behind the previous crop. The plan would be to not apply um, any growth regulator on this crop, to assess it for disease over the next few weeks, whether it needs a fungicide application or not, and then to put out early nitrogen. So um, 75 kilos to the hectare, um, we'll say the early day, middle of February, whenever growth gets underway. And the crop, compared to the crop below, which will receive a uh, growth regulator. I'm here just outside Arklow on my brother's farm, and I'm in a crop of oilseed rape sown on the 11th of September. Unlike the crops you've seen already that Veronica had in Strad Valley or Elaine down in Cork, this crop has been severely grazed by pigeons, as you can see. It got a bag and a half of 10, 10, 20, just like the crop in Strad Valley did that you saw with Veronica. And it was also sown only a day later. But as you can see, it's a completely different crop. Uh, it possibly did look like that crop in Strad Valley two months ago. But the pigeons have been in here and have done a right job here grazing it down to the butt. 
So what do we do with crops like this? So unlike those crops we saw in the first part of this video, this crop obviously needs to be driven on early with nitrogen. There's no point in delaying nitrogen in this crop. We'll never get it to the green area index, the target of three and a half at early flowering. So we're gonna to have to push this crop early. Once we get a little bit of spring growth, which hopefully is just around the corner, uh, we'll get out nitrogen on this crop in the next fortnight, hopefully. Uh, hopefully ground conditions will allow us. We have had about four inches of rain here in the last week. So the plan is to put two bags of 18612 on with some sulfur in the next fortnight, just to push it on. And then probably about two weeks after that, we'll try and push it on again with another, you know, 100 kilos to the hectare of nitrogen, about 80 units. So unlike the crops we saw already where you're trying to delay that first split of nitrogen that are their forward crops, this is certainly one we want to push on to get this green area index up or else we will suffer yield penalty. So just by looking over the field here, you, you wouldn't really think it would have a green area index of 0.4 or 0.5, but amazingly, I did do a, a measurement there with the phone and took a picture, and I took four recordings around the field, and they came back between 0.35 and the best was 0.5, so there's about an average of about 0.4. So if we look at the crop more carefully, you will see that the plants are there, and there's a good healthy tap root so these crops should bounce back should respond really well to nitrogen we just need to make sure now we get these pigeons moved away so as well as the nitrogen management it's also very important to apply the correct amount of phosphorus and potassium to the crop so the crop as i mentioned earlier got one and a half bags of 10 10 20 in the autumn into the seed bed and so it got some of its p and k there so just to top up the p and k to the correct level this is an index three site so we need to apply roughly two bags per acre of 18,612 uh, in, in the split coming up soon. And that should give us our total P and K requirement for the crop. The other important thing with this crop with oilseed rape is that it needs boron. This crop finally got a spray of boron about uh, three weeks ago, uh, back when there was a little bit of a drier spell of weather. Uh, we also went through the crop with curb to control weeds at the same time it will need more boron and it's important we get certainly that boron by flowering but ideally we'll try and get that boron spray on soon in maybe three or four weeks time when we're targeting likely light leaf spot this is a light sandy soil here so we know that it could lend itself to boron deficiency and even a mild deficiency could lead to problems such as poor pod set uh, less seeds per pod and poor seed weight so that's why we will be topping up the boron in our next application to the field. So why are we trying to achieve a target canopy or green area index of three and a half? Well, later on, it's to ensure that we don't end up reflecting too much light back up into the sky due to excessive flower. We also want to create a canopy whereby the light can get down in, onto the lower branches and the lower pods and fill those pods and seeds better. So that's why we are aiming for this three and a half. And in summary, we try to forward load the nitrogen on thin crops like this behind me. And we try to delay the nitrogen on crops that already have a very good green area index. Okay, thanks very much um, to Veronica, Elaine and Martin. And I think Martin gave a, a very good summary there in the end of the differences between the crops, um, you know, you can see the differences between locations and even crops that were very close together and the effects that obviously that 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 pigeons um, are, are having on crops. And uh, so I suppose a lot of the questions are around GEI and the management of the early nitrogen. So I'm going to start with, with one here from from uh, Keith. I think I've lost it here again, but I think the question is around GEI and Shea, maybe you I might throw this one to you. Firstly, um, where do you get the app? And, and maybe just a very brief description. Veronica did it very well there, but just a summary of how to use it and the importance of the GAI, Shay. Yeah, to start off with, Kieran, it's it's a, an app developed in the UK by uh, B, B in conjunction with BASF. Um, it's available for iPhone users only. It's not available on the Google Play Store, as far as I know. Um, but if you go into a website there and just uh, Google uh, green area index you'll be able to calculate it off off the bsf website or, or there are other websites there as well so you'll be able to calculate it off that input your photographs into it 
uh, and away you go. But it's very handy if you have an iPhone that you can do it there on, on, on in the field. Um, like Veronica says there, it gives you a good measure then of how much leaf is in the field and critically how much nitrogen is in the field. So as we know, uh, oil to rape stores the nitrogen in its leaves. So once those leaves are removed, uh, as you could see in, in Martin's picture there, um, you're removing nitrogen. So you kind of have to top that up again. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of the importance of it. It kind of gives you a good starting point for where you are at the moment. And it gives you a, a, a target as to where you need to go uh, at flowering at, at three and a half GAI. So it's a measure of the, as Veronica says, there's a measure of the area of leaf uh, on the on a meter square at that time. Okay, thanks, thanks, Shay. A, a useful one that I kind of use is a GAI of, of one is approximately fifty percent ground cover. I suppose it kind of gives mm. you gives you an idea, but the app is obviously very very useful. Um, there's a question here in relation to what's the panel's views on maybe using urea compared to, to nitrogen for the early application of oil seed rape. Maybe Michael, I might I might put that one to you. Yeah, I I wouldn't see a big issue, Kieran, especially if you uh, conditions that are conjunctive to using urea. Um, the one reservation I would have is if if you need to put on a lot of sulfur. That's why we typically went with ASN and that you, you, you'd front loaded your sulfur on. And I think that when it comes to urea products, you know, that you're, you, you know, I think some of the best some are offering about seven, seven to eight percent sulfur. Um, so you're not going to get enough sulfur there if, if if sulfur is your requirement. I suppose that that would be my really only re reservation. Mm -hmm. But as regards yeah. the nitrogen source, Kieran, I, I wouldn't see why, why there would be, would be an issue. Okay, okay. And Richie, I might come to you just on that sulfur one. Um, we have a question here. Um, if the GI is one and a half, say, or two, when would the sulfur go on? And maybe how would delaying it affect nutrient use efficiency? Well, I suppose, first of all, if the crop is, is that advanced, it, it will have been getting sulfur anyway. And, and soils, obviously, will, unless you're on a very sandy soil, soils will, will be contributing quite a bit of, of sulfur to the crop. But I suppose in that case, when you're going with your first split, you would be looking at something like, like ASM to get on as much of the sulfur in your first nitrogen as possible. But I, I would be timing the application regarding nitrogen rather than sulfur. So when, when the crop actually needs the nitrogen rather than, than, than the sulfur. In terms of how it affects NUE, uh, that the crop uses a sulfur with nitrogen. So if, if it doesn't need the, the nitrogen early, it doesn't need, it's not going to need the sulfur early either. So uh, as I said, the two of them are sort of inter, interlinked in the, in, in the plant and how the plant metabolizes. Um, so it's, it's, it's going to use the sulfur with the nitrogen. And, and uh, so when it needs the nitrogen, it'll need the sulfur uh, as well. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much, Richie. And just to, can I just get on this one? I'm not going to ask you what levels of nitrogen we'd have in the soil, but this might be for people that don't have oilseed rape a relevant question as well in terms of what are the factors maybe that we'd be looking at in terms of, of soil nitrogen and, and what, you know, we could expect this spring? Yeah, well, sure. I, I suppose the, the, the first thing that, that sort of dictates how much nitrogen a crop is going to get from the soil is, 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 is the soil type. So heavier soils will tend to give more than, than light, light sandy soils. Next most important thing is organic matter, higher organic matter soils. So soils that are near grass are obviously going to give you a lot more nitrogen than soils that have been cultivated for many, many, many years. Uh, and then I suppose yeah, the, in terms of climate, it's the amount of rain over winter. So if, if you have a lot of rain over the winter period on, on, on winter crops, uh, winter sown area, you're, you're going to lose a certain amount of the nitrogen that would have been in the soil. Um, this winter is sort of part of December was higher rainfall than normal, if I remember correctly, but the rest of the months have been sort of around about normal. So I, I, I'd be expecting sort of normal levels of, of uh, soil nitrogen uh, coming, from, coming from the crops. So I wouldn't be adding more nitrogen because I thought it was going to be less nitrogen. That could all change in the next couple of weeks, but at the minute, that would be what we would be thinking. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Richie. Um, I might just do a final one on, on oilseed rape for the time being, uh, Shay, in relation, there's a question here in relation to growth regulation of oilseed rape. Um, you know, obviously those grazed crops with low GEIs wouldn't receive a growth regulator, but Shay, what would your advice be there and, and maybe the benefits of it? Yeah, um, again, Kieran, it comes back to assessing your crop that's there in front of you and, and making decisions on that. If you have a, a very large canopy, so something like that's a GAI of two, um, and you put a whole lot of nitrogen onto that, that's your first, that's your first problem. You're, you're, you're not going to affect 
you're not going to be able to control their canopy. So nitrogen is, the, is probably the first place you start off with and, and when you actually time that nitrogen in terms of manipulating that, that canopy and whether you need growth regulation or not. So that's the first place to start with. After that, if you, if you have to try and manipulate canopies, then you're looking at the fungicide type. Um, so you have something like with tebiconazole or something like that in it, will we'll control will have some growth regulatory effect as well metconazole. Uh, and there's a new product out there this year from um, BSF called Carix, which is a, a mixture of metconazole and mepiquat chloride, which also gives a, 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 a growth regulatory effect. And I suppose the, the, re, the, 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 the problem with, with big, large canopies, as Martin has mentioned them earlier on, but the other problem that can happen is it, you can start get leaning or lodging, uh, whereby you get a, a, a kink in the stem and the stem starts to lean over. Once, once stems start to do that, you start to, you can start to get yield loss very, very quickly. Uh, and just to kind of give you an idea, if you have a, uh, a crop that's kind of half leaned over, say, at a 40, 45 degree angle or something like that, or at a 90 degree angle, you can get 45, 50% of the yield loss straight away. So that's before the crop ever gets to harvest because it's just not filling the, the, the pods. But I would start, you know, before people start putting out growth regulatory fungicides, I'd be start with my nitrogen strategy and seeing where that goes first. And just I, I just wanted to mention there as well. And Martin mentioned it as well about heavily grazed crops. Um, no point putting out nitrogen on those crops and not moving off the pigeons. You have to control the pigeons as well because if you put out the nitrogen and you grow more leaf, the pigeons are just going to stay grazing off that leaf. So you have to move off those pigeons as well. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh... Um, we're going to start on our final topic of, of winter wheat. Um, and again, I suppose the winter wheat area recovered this year. And, um, you know, there was better opportunities than, than the previous year, certainly, to get in the ground. So we're, we're back up to a near normal area. So Michael McCarthy is reporting from Cork. Ivan is in, Ivan Witten is in Kildare. And Phelan McDonald is reporting from the weed screen there in Oak Park. So we'll hear from the lads. And again, just a reminder to submit your questions um, there during the, on the Q&A tab. Uh, we're here in a crop of Graham winter wheat sown on the 22nd of October last year. Um, sown at about 350 seeds to the square metre and we've done a plant count and we're, we, we, we've counted about 280 plants to the square metre. So we're looking at about maybe 81-82% uh, establishment that way. So we're very pleased with the establishment. Um, it was sown in reasonably good conditions, you know, I, I know it got a bit... Uh, damper towards the end of October last year but this is light ground and it, it was sown in, in good condition so um, this crop has received no treatment since it was sown um, we sowed it on like I said the 22nd of October so taking into account our sowing date it emerged in early November and following IPM practice we decided that it didn't need an aphicide at that stage because you know we, we, we took all the advice was there it was it was sown later in October emerged early in November we felt aphids weren't a threat so it didn't receive an aphicide and neither has it received a herbicide okay so we've done a quick walk and what we found is we found metagrass we have found some speedwells groundsel chickweed um bit of cleavers um, and of course, as you can see, a lot of volunteer beans, as it was a crop was after beans. So I was the question going forward now is what kind of treatment we're going to give it. Um, what we're thinking is Alistair. Uh, when conditions allow, I suppose we're not we're not in a hurry out and ground yet. Ground is still a bit wet. So once the conditions allow, we'll be using our Alistair and, bio, and Biopower mix. Um, we will have to come back at a later date for for wild oat control this field has a particularly uh, bad problem with wild oats so we will have to come back with a later date in our wild, wild oat control so now we look at a different scenario this is a crop of costello which was sown on the 10th of november so sown slightly later than the previous crop it was sown at 400 seeds to the square meter and the establishment rate we're happy with it and um, given that it was set in slightly harsher conditions and that bit later so We've done a weed assessment and we have found uh, we found some groundsel, we found some charlock, we found some chickweed, and we found fumitry uh, and some volunteer oilseed rape as well. So we've 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 a good spread of broadleaf weeds, but 
I feel like this, it, it always highlights the importance of walking a crop and making a correct assessment because as we walk this crop, we found this guy, which is sterile brome. And that changes the, the, the plan here completely because we're dealing with a much more, more different animal, okay? So we can't rely on our traditional uh, broadleaf weed killers that we would have used in the previous crop. So we're now looking at using, you know, some of the, 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 the weed the grass weed killers, likes of, uh, you know, Broadway Star or Pacif Pacifica. The plan for this field would be to use Broadway Star once the, the conditions allow. Good morning. This morning we're going to talk to you about managing tin crops of winter wheat. Let me set the scene to you. We're here in a block of continuous winter wheat sown the middle of October at 185 kilograms per hectare, 12 stones to the acre, or 360 seeds to the square metre. Many of you, when you think back in last autumn, it was very, very tricky to get winter cereals established. Some of it was down to lack of vigour in the seed due to the wet harvest. More of it was down to pest issues out in the field post-establishment. And some of it was down to poor seed bed conditions and late sowing. The fields here were soil sampled back in 2019. The pH came back at 6.5, a ton of magnesium lime was applied to sharpen the soils and the P came in at index 1 and the K came in at index 1. As a result of that, the farmer in question has been applying a bag and a half of 0730 every autumn on top of the plough ground before he sows the crop. I visited this field in the middle of November. On arrival I could see there was an issue in the field as it was starting to be thin. So we, after doing a couple of plant counts, the good section of the fields on my right hand side had a plant count of 270 to 320 seeds per square meter and this section here came in somewhere between 180 and 220. Luckily enough the bag and a half of phosphorus that went out last back end has helped the roots in the crop to get established and to hold on to what we had. The other issue in the field last November was slugs and four kilos per hectare of metahaldehyde slug pellets were applied across the whole area. So here we are now in the middle of February, thinking about what we're going to do over the next four to six weeks to try and encourage the crop to tiller and even to retain the existing tillers that are there at the moment. This morning we've counted somewhere between 160 and 180 plants to the square metre and each of those plants that have three to four plus leaves can be considered an actual weak tiller. So the first thing we're doing is actually looking at the actual plant, having looked at the plants that were retained over the winter. Now let us go down and look at the actual condition of the actual roots to see if there's any white roots starting to appear. And that's a sign that the actual crops are beginning to scavenge for nutrients. We're also looking at the actual thermometer hitting six degrees. So there, you would expect growth on this in the coming couple of weeks. So the first job in hand will be the application of two bags of 11,725 post Valentine's Day, followed by another two bags in early March. It is hoped that the N, P and K will encourage a bit of leaf growth bulk up the root mass and encourage the crops to tiller. As we approach mid-March, around Patrick's Day, the farmer will put on a litre per hectare of chlormaquat, plus or minus an adjuvant, depending on weather conditions. That will be used to encourage further tillering, control apical dominance of the primary tiller and encourage the actual secondary tillers to come on ahead. And then, as we arrive into the early part of April, the crop will get its main split of sulphur can, followed by a mix of CCC and Trinexipac to actually shorten the crop, give a bit of root anchorage, and hopefully prevent any lodging. So I'm at the weed screen trial here in Oak Park, and uh, we want to show you some of the main uh, treatments of interest. The first strip down here is winter wheat which we sowed uh, last September. The next one is winter barley. That's followed by winter oats, a sown crop of winter oats. Beside it we have wild oats, sown wild oats 
and finally we have uh, sterile brome uh, sown here to try and get the, um, the, the weed to grow and put the treatments on it. So the first plot that we're looking at is an untreated plot of winter wheat uh, and we can see there that there's quite a number of weeds have come through that uh, including groundsel, including wild carrot and there's some poppy there as well, fumitory uh, among others. Uh, that's the untreated plot so that just gets your eye in uh, and now we're going to have a look at some of the treated plots. First of all uh, we'll take it as a standard treatment of stomp. Um, the stomp here uh, you can have, see the the effect of it here this is the wild oat uh, no effect there uh, by the stomp. The next one over here is the sterile brome and again very little treatment and beyond that you can see uh, ground cell has come through very very easily there are some other weeds come through as well so not a great response uh, we can see from the winter barley and the winter wheat here in front of us uh, that it has had very little effect on the on the crop itself so the crop has come through it quite well but a little disappointing uh, on the weed control I will say that the uh, the crops here were sown in September and the applications pre-emerge were almost peri-emerge uh, so uh, that, that could account for some of that. On this side of me down here uh, we have Firebird and DeFi. Now in contrast you can see here that there's virtually no uh, wild oat left. There's virtually no sterile brome left either which is quite a good result um, uh, for that. This is the cultivated or sown oats so, so it has had quite an effect on that. It's not an oat product obviously and again we can see that the barley has come through quite well and the wheat has come through quite well. Further on down we can see where the, where the, um, the ground cell germinated itself and that has been wiped out uh, as have most of the other weeds. So a very good result from, from that. At this side of the stomp Again, we can quite see quite similar results. This is Firebird Met, uh, which will be available for use this coming autumn. Uh, and again, a reasonably good result on the uh, wild oats and a reasonably good result on the sterile brome. Uh, very little result on the uh, sown oats, if that was true out your crop. Uh, the barley and the wheat have come through it as well. And further up here, we can see again, the ground cell where it was coming through is now gone. So a good result from, the, uh, fr from that treatment. And we have some post-emergent treatments here as well. Uh, what we're looking at first of all is Bacra Triple, which is this row here. Uh, and the main thing to see here, of course, is that uh, the wild oat here has not been affected at all. And beside it, we have the sterile brome coming through. Uh, insufficient uh, control there altogether uh, with the Bacra Triple post-emergence. Then beside that we have Firebird Met uh, and again we have some of the wild oats coming through and insufficient control of the sterile brome. So we cannot be depending on these products to give us post-emergence control of the uh, sterile brome. Finally then we have uh, Alistair here uh, and as you can see the wild oats are gone. The sterile brome is very much still there. Uh, with lots of other weeds as well, broadleaf weeds, including the, the ground cell. Uh, and the, <clears throat> the sown cultivated oats here have been severely knocked back. They're coming back, but uh, it's, it's not a product for oats. But the main thing is that it got the, it got the wild oats and it didn't get the sterile brome. The final two plots that I have to show you uh, have received no treatments yet. So uh, they're, they're untreated. They are destined for spring applications. Uh, the first one here will be getting Broadway Star at the 265 grams rate and the second plot will be getting Pacifica at the half litre rate. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how they do. Uh, in summary then, uh, what we can say so far is that we do have uh, control options, chemical control options for uh, wild oats uh, in our winter crops uh, and we must tailor our products to that weed uh, if, if it is uh, on your farm. And the second point that I would make is that on the sterile brome, we do need to continue our focus on integrated pest management for that weed because we get less than optimum uh, control of the weed where, where we're depending on the chemicals. So the pre-emergence is certainly better than post-emergence, but the best is going to be if we put IPM to the fore and follow it up with the best we can on our chemicals.
Thanks very much, Phelan and Ivan and, and Michael there from when he was in the fields there in Cork. Um, Jimmy Staples uh, is the only panellist we haven't heard from yet. So, Jimmy, I, I'm going to bring you in there straight away. I suppose Phelan did a very good summary there and I suppose focused on the IPM aspect. Um, you know, and I suppose if we look at the pyramid, the chemical is almost the last resort. But maybe from your experience on the ECT programme, maybe you might share something in relation to how IPM dovetails with, with our chemical control, Jimmy, in relation to maybe sterile brome to start with. Yeah, well, I suppose uh, you're talking about sterile brome, we're talking about a, an autumn herb, an autumn germ germinating grass weed. So you need to understand a bit about it. Um, so it, it, it's going to germinate mostly from um, August, September and early October. So first thing you're thinking is you're looking at pushing back your sowing dates. You push back your sowing dates and then you, um, you're looking at coming in with your, your, your pre-emerge herbicide. Um, pre-emerge is always going to give you better control than, than your post-emerge alone, but uh, following that up then with an autumn post-emerge as well is, is going to give you better control. If we just talk about, um, if we just talk about um, the, the likes of some of the, say Firebird, which would be used an awful lot for, for sterile bone control. Like if, if you look at the results and what we're seeing in the weed screen, Firebird on its own pre-emerge would give you some control, but you'll always get better control when you follow up with, with a post-emerge. Um, uh, really, you want to be looking at using um Firebird will give you about 120 grams of or yeah, 120 grams of um of fluphenicate, but it alone isn't going to give you enough control. You need to be looking at doubling that really. You look, need to be looking at 240 grams of fluphenicate. So you're looking at using 0.6 of um something like Naceto or something along those lines to give you better control. There's buyer have new products coming along. Um Phelan mentioned uh, the Firebird Met, which will be available next autumn. Uh looking at the results there, we got excellent control. Um, control it stopped the brome in its tracks, and there was very little brome came through in the later in the autumn. Even even now in the the last week of January, first week of February, there was very little brome in that situation, and where you'd have crop competition as well, which is obviously something that's not there uh, in that trial. You know, you're looking at at, at a very very good control with, with that type of a product. So, mm. um, yeah. but but again, IPM is crucial. Under knowing what weeds you have, understanding the weeds, knowing its weaknesses, and then using your 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 chemicals, targeting your chemicals, that's, that's really where you're, what you want to be doing. Okay, Thank, thanks, Jimmy. Um, just as we're on the sterile row, Michael, I noticed you had a, a stripper sterile row near, down near a ditch there in Cork. Uh, is there anything from an IPM perspective maybe there that, that we could do a uh, non-chemical option, maybe like arable margins or? Yeah, it, it is an option. Um, you know, if, if people were at, the, the last open day in Oak Park, they would have seen where the, the, the Coxfoot margins were put in. And, you know, it was almost a direct stop where the, 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 the sterile brome stopped and the Coxfoot took on. So it definitely is an option, Kieran, especially when we're going into the future with newer environmental measures and stuff. It may be something that people you know, can consider because what you must remember is like, like that strip we saw in the, in the picture there, like that, that's an extremely unproductive strip. Do you know what I mean? Um, like it looks like almost you know forty percent brome. It's going to have an awful effect on the yield. So a strip like that could be much better off in a, in an arable margin as opposed to you know trying to manage a weed inside it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And and as you say, it stops it spreading out into the yeah. into the rest of the field. Yeah. Um, just a reminder, lads. Um, we 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 still have a few minutes to go. If you have any questions, don't forget to uh, submit them there in the Q and A tab. Shay, um, if I could come to you, Ivan spoke about the management of maybe late or so on our our thinner crops there. Um, just in terms of those management tips, I suppose fertilizer, Shay, is probably one of the key ones uh, this spring. Yeah, uh, he's right, um, Kieran. I mean, basically, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get those crops to catch up. Uh, to where they should really be at this stage. Um, and tiller manipulation, tiller development, if you can see from Ivan's clip there, is basically what he's talking about. Trying to promote those tillers to grow and to produce the heads. I mean, we still need to get to, you know, somewhere around seven, 800 heads a square meter by, by harvest time. So we want to kind of get as many of those as we possibly can. So we have to try and promote those tillers to, to, to get them to, 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 to grow, um, albeit, wheat is a better capacity to, to compensate for load 
no head numbers than Dan Barley does. But at the same time, we still need to we still need to try and promote them. So Ivan tried right there. If we can stimulate them by uh, early nitrogen, provided of course soil temperatures are good enough. And he showed the, the the photograph there of the thermometer in the ground where it was just six seven degrees. You know, you, you need those sort of temperatures to have any sort of uptake of nitrogen. And think about four degrees. You know, crops are growing, but certainly the the higher the temperatures, the better. And you'll notice from what Ivan was talking about there, he wasn't loading on a lot of nitrogen early on because the capacity of the crop there to utilize that nitrogen at this time of the year just isn't there. So from that point of view, it was a little and often. So he was looking at splitting those, that first typical application of about 40 to 50 kilos of nitrogen. So he was splitting it in two. So he was putting out a small bit to kind of get the crop to start off. And then he was, he was finishing off probably by about growth stage 30 to get that first split, if you like, uh, back on track. The other thing he was looking at there as well um, is manipulation with, with, with PGRs. And again, that's about strengthening the crop at the base, making sure that those tillers, those that apical dominance of that main uh, shoot is, is held back and you have the, uh, the, the side tillers then get the opportunity of coming through and, um, and, and growing. So you're trying to make sure that, you know, that, that early PGR is too low, is trying to strengthen the base of the crop, but also try to promote those side tillers to come on as well. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Shay. And I, I know, Richie, you've looked at it before, but but wheat, you know, if plants are evenly distributed, we can actually go down to quite low plant counts uh, and still have viable crops. Uh, that, that's correct, Kieran. I suppose wheat is quite different to barley. And barley, we know high head numbers important in wheat. Uh, the, the crop can make up in two ways, either by having more heads or by having more grains in each head. And where you get lower plop populations, what tends to happen is the crop makes up the difference by putting more grains in, in, into the head. So it's not quite as important to get a, a, a high head number in wheat as it is in barley. There, there's a second mechanism that kicks in later in the season. Okay, thanks, Richie. And uh, uh, Jimmy, back to you. A question from Sean here. Uh, any observations on the extent of black grass in Ireland now? Yeah, I, I, we, I was doing a bit of, uh, tried to do a bit of a bit of research on it there over the autumn time and, and get um, get a bit of input from the trade and from the department and, and from the Chagas advisors there. From the, To the best of our knowledge, there's, there's probably around 100 cases of, of black grass in the country now at the moment. But like it's it's hard to get an accurate number on it when farmers are, are not, you know, they don't want to come come forward and say, look, and hold their hand up for whatever reason it may be, which are, and a lot of them are, are justifiable. But so we're, we're not 100 percent sure, but that's where it looks at the moment. And the worrying thing is that's that's an, that's an increase on last year and it's an increase on the year before as well. So it, it seems to be going in the wrong direction. Um, so um, it's, uh, it's 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 a worrying trend, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. And if any farmers concerned, Jimmy, what what steps should they take? Maybe contact their local advisor or. Yeah, contact your local advisor. Um, my feel free to contact me. Like it can be anonymously if they want. Like there's no, there should be no pressure on anybody to to give the, put their name or whatever. Like, but feel free to give me a shout or give their local advisor a shout. Whoever it might be. And um, there's always there's always there's always ways and means of, of solving the issue or or getting on top of it. Like, but acting acting quickly and acting early is 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 the key thing you know once okay. once because if it gets a hole it's it's very very difficult to get on top of yeah it. absolutely so early, early identification and early control and taking all all ipm measures i suppose jimmy is the is the key yeah. message isn't it yeah exactly okay. yeah lads um uh we're kind of run out of time but just uh just to wrap up there's a few things there are still a few questions there and i know the lads in the background are are doing individual replies or we'll get back to anybody who's any specific questions after just want to remind you that the second part of the tillage conference is on wednesday the 17th of february at 11 30 a.m so um you know you can register for that there online and i suppose topical from finishing up where where, where jimmy was there today herbicide resistance uh, and grass weed problems will, will be discussed there. We will also be discussing um, development of IPM strategies for the control of septoria blotch on, uh, blotch on, on winter wheat. Stephen Kildare will deal with that. And Dermot Forrestal is a very interesting presentation on crop establishment systems and rotations in, in combination. So, you know, that look, that's a, the, a six year study it looks at the plough, shallow till, min till, and min till there in combination with break crops. So, there's, there's very interesting information going to come out of that. 
Um, finally, I'd like to thank all our contributors today, both those in the videos, our panelists, and especially to Shay and Martin, who did all the video editing. And I know that takes a lot of time and effort, and especially to Michael Hennessy, who brought the whole event together. Um, and especially to you, the attendees, uh, thank you for your attendance, first of all, and for your questions. That's, that's what makes the event. I suppose as well, we, as this is a, a new way of communicating for us, as I said at the start, we'd normally be out in the fields frozen as it would have been today, but uh, this is a new way of communicating for us. Uh, we will be sending out a survey and, you know, we would appreciate any, any feedback there and that will help enhance um, future events. So finally, look, I hope that today's event addressed some of the issues and, that you were going to come across on your farm in the next few weeks. So that's all for today and till the next time.